TV Crazy Man here. I've compiled together some of the funniest and most interesting classic TV Halloween goofs I could find for this video. So start out your spooky Halloween season with some fun from classic television's past. Are you ready for some cool Munsters goofs? Let's see what kind of weird stuff we can find that doesn't fit. Costume issues, screwed up lines, and a hand that comes out of nowhere because the hand belongs in the Adams family, not the Munsters. <laughs> Some of these goose bloopers or anomalies, whatever you want to call them, are clearly mistakes. Others make you pause to question what's going on. Some are honestly invisible with old TV screens that weren't as high def as we have today. But those are all the more interesting as we get to pull back the curtain and see what's going on behind the scenes just a bit. First, let's check out some goose from the episode My Fair Munster. <laughs> Not as much a goof as a point of fact, Al Lewis has a prosthetic nose in the second episode My Fair Munster that disappears in future episodes. Perhaps Grandpa had plastic surgery. Of course, Grandpa could have come up with something in the lab to reshape his nose. In that same episode, Herman loses his well, top of his head for a second, and it keeps coming back off and on. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I ever heard in all of my life. <laughs> That's not the last time Herman almost lost his top. It happened again in season two's Herman's lawsuit. When Herman faints after getting hit by a car, not because he was hurt, though, but because he was afraid of getting sued. See his wig flop back and forth? <laughs> On my Munster's Goose video, I forgot to mention the pole that comes down at the top the same time the car hits Herman. Apparently, it must have had something to do with the car falling apart. And thanks to the viewers that mentioned that one in the comments. <laughs> Here's one for how did they do that file? When Grandpa transforms into a bat, it's not a trap door or anything like that. Uh, at least not in this scene. After Grandpa transforms into a bat, you see Al Lewis in the bottom right corner of the frame as he ducks out of sight. In the context of the show, maybe Grandpa was just trying to trick everybody into thinking he went the other way. In the episode Low Cow Munster, Paul Ann guest stars as Herman's doctor, who really needs his glasses. When his nurse comes to bring them to him, the actress flubs her line, probably because of Paul Ann making a funny face or something. Check this out. Oh, and this actually made it into the episode. Here are your glasses, doctor. <laughs> Thank you, nurse. Here are your glasses, doctor. <laughs> Thank you, nurse. She's pretty, but pokey. Okay, on this scoo from the episode Knockwood, Here Comes Charlie, I wonder if any of you out there have seen this goof before, uh, before we had the uh, benefit of HD television. So yeah, let me know if you've seen this goof years ago before HD television came out. <laughs> it's my head broken. Look to your left. It's actually kind of spooky. Now in the real world, it could be crewmen, but in the context of the show, maybe it's ghosts. There's another ghost in Autumn Crocus. Again, look to your left. I'm coming, dear. I'm coming. Yeah, I know I said maybe it's a crewman, maybe in the context of this show it's a ghost, but what if it's a real life ghost? We just don't know. And I think we owe it to our country to keep our sense of humor. In everybody's favorite episode, Hot Rod Herman, with the first appearance of the Dragula car, when Grandpa drives out the car for the first time, something fishy is going on. What's Grandpa doing to his face? Is this even Grandpa? I suspect it's a, just a stand-in for Al Lewis. And it looks like he's trying to put his face back on. Now for the parachute. Here's another goof I missed on my Munster's Goose video. In the scene where Grandpa is racing the Dragula and Herman has to stop him, every instance we see a close-up of Grandpa driving, it's actually obvious that he's not moving by looking at the background, which I'll admit may have not been noticeable in old TV sets, 
But today we can definitely see a plain background that looks, I don't know, kind of like a cloth with a fold in it, at least as far as I can tell. What do you think? Post your thoughts in the comments. Oh, and they did add some smoke to give the illusion of movement. In the episode Bronco Bustin' Munster, Grandpa sees his reflection in a vending machine mirror at the rodeo. So, on one hand, Count Dracula isn't supposed to have a reflection. But of course, vampires can't stand sunlight either. I read that uh, some people consider this a goof, but you know, I think Grandpa, who's created a million different pills for every kind of sickness or magical need that's come up, has probably by this time conquered the reflection problem and the sunlight issue. Oh, goody, goody! In the episode, Herman, Coach of the Year, Herman throws a discus and something magical happens. You know, Herman must have scared that discus so bad it turned into a football. In the episode, Herman picks a winner. Herman tries to make his escape from some dirty crooks. And he may have gotten a hand from Thing, from the Adams family. Otherwise, where did his hand come from? And what was that about? In the episode, A House Divided, when Herman is testing Eddie's present, he seems to become much smaller once he gets going down the road. <laughs> Irregardless, this scene and this episode is hilarious. This scene in particular. It just cracks me up every time I see it. <laughs> well, we talked about a lot of goose. How about we talk about what I think is the best scene of all the episodes of the Munsters. Well, it's my favorite anyway. From the episode All-Star Munster. Yeah, what is it? You're closer to my feet than I am. Would you mind putting out the fire? It features Pat Bootram, a.k.a. Mr. Haney, and Robert Easton as Moose Mallory. Thank you, son, but don't expect me to do it every time. I really can't say what it is about this scene that I think is so funny. I guess it's just the fact that Moose is so lazy that he's literally on fire and he won't be bothered to get up and put this put his feet out. <laughs> Perhaps it's the fact that somewhere in my lifetime, I think I've known some people that are that bad off. Thank you, Paul. Well, let's run through some quick, amazing trivia facts that you may not have known. Oh, goody, goody. According to the episode Herman's Lawsuit in this uh, close-up of Herman's license, Herman is 7 foot 6 inches tall and he weighs 380 pounds. Oh yeah, and they misspelled uh, heights. Which I'm not going to harp on too much because I misspell things too. I bet you didn't know that Herman Munster is a charter member of the Pat Boone fan club. And that was revealed in the episode Operation Herman. My boy! Daddy! <laughs> Did you know that the wolf man is Grandpa's son? And Lily's brother? I'm not sure how that works. But definitely a face to be proud of. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> well, if you'd rather, we could refer to them as interesting anomalies that give us a tiny peek behind the scenes of the making of the Adams Family. How's that? Beautiful. Beautiful. And stay tuned to find out what Lurch's mother looked like. And what actress could be brave enough to play Lurch's mother. <laughs> First, let's check out some Thing Goose. <laughs> Gomez, darling, do be careful. In the second season episode, Portrait of Gomez, the Thing is fanning Morticia in the moonlight when he retreats into the tree hole. But either the Thing isn't the only one hanging out by the tree, or the Thing has grown an elbow. Kinda strange, isn't it? Unprofessional jealousy can twist a man's mind. Thank you, Thing. In the very first episode, the Adams family goes to school. The Thing hands the phone to Morticia and then takes off. But careful observation may indicate that the thing may actually have a body, or at least a foot. And from what I read, it was probably Ted Cassidy's foot. <laughs> when the thing stops a politician from leaving, his box pops up, revealing, of course, that the thing is hiding under the table. Now, I wish we could have got the entire picture. I could just see Ted Cassidy underneath the table, hiding out. It was kind of eerie. 
<laughs> you know, it always cracks me up to hear him growl like that. It's just, it's just funny. <laughs> In the episode Halloween with the Adams Family, you can tell someone is moving around under the table when the thing hands the mail to Wednesday. In the episode Fester's Punctured Romance, we get to see Gomez actor John Aston doing his standing on his head routine. But if you wondered if there was a trick to it, he did have just a little bit of help in the form of a string attached to his leg to your right. It would still demand a bit of uh, balance and strength to perform this feat. The string just helped him with making it through the entire scene. Obviously. In the episode My Fair Cousin It, Gomez is pulling off an amazing balancing act, but it's clear from the top that there's a string attached to the first item that links all of the items being balanced. And as soon as I get a little more practice, then I want to hook it. I don't suppose you would believe it was just a test. Well, with the Adams Family, sometimes it's hard to tell what's a goof and what's done on purpose. It really keeps you on your toes. I'm Sam Hilliard from the Sherwood School. How do you do, Mr. Hilliard? Hello. In the very first episode, we see Gomez blow up his train set next to Mr. Hilliard. Now, if you're like me and you've watched the Adams Family a few million times over the years, you probably think Gomez has blown up that train like a million times. But that's not quite the case. In the second episode, Gomez blows up his toy train with Morticia watching. Or does he? <laughs> now, if you look closely, one second you see that Morticia is clearly standing there and then all of a sudden Mr. Hillard is right there in the room from uh, the first episode. <laughs> Mr. Hillard is there again in episode 11, kind of like a ghost that's haunting this train set. It happens again in episode 22 when Pugsley is the one operating the train. Now I haven't verified this for certain, but I bet you every time that train explodes, on the Adams Family, it's from that very first episode. <laughs> in the episode Art and the Adams Family, Fester and Gomez are standing on their heads, and Gomez has a newspaper on the floor in front of him, but when he gets up, both the paper and Uncle Fester are gone. In the same episode, when Sam Picasso arrives at the Adams House, Wednesday is playing by the foot of the steps, and the next shot when she greets Picasso, she's instantly moved to the grass beside the two graves. While this is going on, a crew member's head is visible at the lower right of the screen. Of course, this probably would not have been seen on an older TV set. In the episode, Cousin It visits the Adams family. The steam from a hot drink that Gomez is drinking, I assume, should be coming from his ears in this clip, but it's actually coming from behind his head. Now somebody right now is writing in the comments, TV crazy man, you are way too picky. And yes, yes I am, but I still love classic TV. Now I hate algebra, and you'll never catch me nitpicking about that. I mean, right? <laughs> I found another ghostly train scene in the episode Morticia's Romance, part one. I don't see Mr. Hillard, but who is that ghostly looking figure in the background on the left? Gomez is wearing his usual jacket, which is different than the one in the previous shot. But who is that zombie looking dude way in the back on the left? I actually think Mr. Hillard is there, he's just covered by the smoke. But I've never seen this weird zombie to the left before. Interesting. No, wait, I went back and looked at the first episode. It's, it's just a statue, not, it's, it's not a zombie. In the episode, Halloween, Adam style, Gomez and Uncle Fester are in a contest to see who can grab the first apple with their teeth. Notice that Gomez's apples are all swirling around, but when the camera backs off to where we can see Fester and Gomez at the same time, the apples are at a dead stop. And then they start swirling again when we see a close-up of Gomez. It's weird, bizarre, and completely unearthly. 
Nothing in this world behaves like this, obviously, leading one to believe there was something strange going on in the set of The Addams Family. In the episode Morticia the Rider, there is something that happens on the screen that is quite terrifying. I'm not talking about the crazy amounts of secondhand smoke that Gomez is breathing out into the atmosphere either. Just keep your eye out towards the end of the clip, right behind Gomez. <laughs> Now I know some of you are going to say that it's just a crew member responsible for blowing smoke possibly, but then what if it's something else entirely? Something sinister? What does your imagination tell you? Post your thoughts in the comments. I'm thinking maybe a, a ghost werewolf hiding from Kolchak to Night Stalker, or maybe it's Bigfoot trying to get away from the six million dollar man. I don't know. I'm with you, pal. In the episode of Christmas with the Adams Family, Gomez's part in his hair changes sides literally from one shot to the next, and so does his chain. Either they flip the picture, or this is a sign of the zombie apocalypse. I'll let you be the judge on that one. Must be a nut! <laughs> Have you ever noticed that the grass in the Adams family yard doesn't act naturally? And why should it? I mean, you know, but still, it's almost as if it were, I don't know, carpet? <laughs> and now the moment you've all been waiting for. Just who was Lurch's mother? And what did she look like? Now, quick! Yes, yes Mom. <laughs> yep, that's Ellen Corby, best known as Grandma on the Waltons in the 70s TV series. Isn't it hilarious to even think of Grandma Walton as the mother of Lurch from the Adams Family? Does this mean Lurch is a, a Walton or something? Good night, everybody. Good night, Mama. Good night, Ben. Good night, everyone. Good night, Mama. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Lurch. <laughs> Good night, children. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Elizabeth. Pretty quiet down now and get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and you might have recognized Ellen Corby from It's a Wonderful Life as well. Oh, and the episode Mother Lurch appears on was the season one episode Mother Lurch Visits the Adams Family. <laughs> Let's visit the classic TV show Bewitched, starring Elizabeth Montgomery and Dick York, and look for some interesting goofs that are sometimes funny, sometimes enlightening as to how the shows are made, and sometimes pretty cool in their own right. In the season one episode, Red Light, Green Light, Darren stays up all night working on an ad, but his friend Dave has a suggestion for him. I think you should add, and bring your friends. But the only problem is that it already says, bring all your friends, on the ad. And we know this because they already showed us a close-up of Darren's work. In the season one episode, Open the Door, Witchcraft, Darren and Samantha are locked inside their garage when a newly installed door garage opener malfunctions and Samantha is sworn in anger never to use her witchcraft again. Funny plot, and I don't want to ruin the episode for you, so forget what I'm about to tell you. Wait a minute. The garage had a side door for easy exit that was seen a couple of times in the episode. Darren and Samantha were never really trapped, even if you discounted Samantha's powers. Well, always remember if you're looking for a house, and it has a garage. Make sure it has a door to the side to escape with. Another weird thing is that once the men have installed an automatic opener for the garage door, it opens awfully quickly and is quiet as a whisper, which is probably means that the door is controlled by someone manually off camera. And when the Stevens sit in their garage with the door wide open, instead of the street and the houses we would expect to see that were shown to be all around already in the series, the background that we see is a painting of rocks and trees, as if the Stevens live way out in the country. Worse than ever. In the episode Abner Cadabra, when Abner knocks on the Stevens' door as soon as he enters the house, a mysterious hand can be seen outside, ensuring that the front door is closed. It's eerie. It gives me the creeps. Of course, this could be explained as a guest appearance by a thing from the Adams family. 
in which case he also made a guest appearance on the Munsters. So I guess apparently they were worried about doors not shutting properly back then, so they had somebody who had actually pulled the door shut. There's obviously something the matter with that darn door. You know, I wonder how much that gig paid. <laughs> In the season two episode, take two aspirins and half a pint of porpoise milk. Mrs. Kravis drops her bowl of soup when she runs out of Samantha's bedroom. Later when she goes back to get it, it looks like it's full of soup again. On the season two episode, and then I wrote, near the end, when Darren and Samantha return from a play, the actress playing Mrs. Kravis can be seen through the door waiting for her cue to ring the doorbell. Or, Mrs. Kravis was up to something that was not revealed on this episode. Hello? I don't know about you, but I don't trust her. I bet she was eavesdropping again. In the episode, A Strange Little Visitor, a warlock kid named Merle that the Stevens are babysitting throws a super fast ball to Darren, knocking him down. But the real magic appears that the ball doesn't seem to be originating from Merle's hand. On a side note, the kid's father was played by James Doohan, aka Mr. Scott from Star Trek. Maybe the kid was also from the future. On the season 2 episode, Samantha the Dressmaker, and Dora, Sam's mother, puts a spell on some models, freezing them in time. But the model in blue can't help but blink. Honestly though, I have to give him credit for standing so still. The dude was actually the actor that played the robot Jaime on Get Smart. Even though I think he was using the table to help balance himself, this was still a pretty hard position to be completely still in. Now if you look carefully, you can see that he was struggling to keep that leg still. In the episode, Follow That Witch, Part 2, when Samantha pops in at a bad guy's apartment to teach him a lesson and zaps the champagne ball, causing the cork to knock the chandelier right off the chain. The table breaks before the chandelier hits it. I wonder what it would have looked like if they would have just let the chandelier hit naturally without the table being set to break on its own. Of course, with flying debris going everywhere, it might have been a little dangerous. In the episode, The Moment of Truth, when Samantha opens the door before Aunt Clara parachutes in, there are no houses behind her, which doesn't make much sense as we usually see houses everywhere on the street. We know for sure the Kravises live across the street, possibly at an angle, but it's literally supposed to be a walk across the street. The reason, of course, is because the scene was shot on a set in the studio, and they used a painted background that didn't really match what we were led to believe existed in this neighborhood. Of course, they didn't really make it for large, high-definition TV sets that we have today. They must have been banking on the idea that nobody could really see the backdrop very clearly back then. <laughs> Unfortunately, I guess we'll never know for sure what Morning Glory Circle actually looked like. In the episode, Twitch or Treat, when we first see Samantha's Halloween party, you can see a floating tray with champagne glasses. Boris, the warlock, walks to it and picks one up. A few minutes later, Boris arrives at the front door of the house for the first time with his cat, the one that turns into a girl. And Andorra greets him as if he just arrived. Boris, how good of you to come. Hello, Boris. Yep, it's definitely that same guy. You know the people that I know you can see, but I'm not too sure about the people you know. What's a very stupid cow. <laughs> On the episode, the corn is as high as a gurney's eye. When a cow comes down in the elevator, an extra wearing a light-colored shirt is seen behind Sam and Darren. A split second later, he's behind these guys in the back over towards the very left. Then they cut back to Sam and Darren where the extra is still standing. Then we cut back again, and there he is, still. The extra goes to assist the elevator operator, but on the cut back to Sam and Darren, he is still behind him. Either he has a twin, or there was some magic behind the scenes, or maybe somebody just goofed on this one. Exactly. Did you ever notice that Darren's boss, Larry Tate, and his wife's bedroom have so much in common with the Stevens' bedroom? They have the exact same curtains, for one. Their carpet is the exact same color. The fireplace looks exactly the same. 
The door going to the bathroom looks exactly the same, and the color of the walls looks exactly the same. Am I missing anything? Let me know in the comments. So? So? Well, I thought it was kind of interesting. <clears throat> uh, moving right along. Here's a goof that I've seen a lot on old movies and TV shows. In the episode, Toys in Babeland. When Larry Tate leaves the Stevens home with a live toy soldier, he casts a shadow in the painted backdrop. The same thing happens on the episode Allergic to Macedonian Dodo Birds, when Samantha and Aunt Clara cast a small shadow on what is supposed to be Sky on the far left. Probably would have been mostly cut off on old TV sets though. I don't blame Elizabeth Montgomery for not wanting to film this scene on a roof. I've been on plenty in my lifetime and I still hate going on roofs. In the episode, If They Never Met, Sam gets to see Darren's life if he would have never met her. Apparently he gets to drive a really cool car. When Andorra and Sam appear in front of Darren's office building, they are half faded to show that they're invisible to the people that pass by, but the pedestrians are half faded as well. Still a very interesting episode. It's the kind of storyline that made Bewitched such an interesting, fun show to watch. Okay, now let's look at a goof from a spooky episode of The Bionic Woman. The second season episode, The Night Demon, has a sort of a Scooby-Doo vibe going on. As Jamie discovers an empty monster costume she later wears herself to scare the same crooks that were using it before in earlier scenes. Keep in mind, Jamie herself wears this costume later, so we know it's empty right now, or it's supposed to be. But if you look carefully, you can see the creature's eyes are actually moving. Now that's spooky. Somebody's playing games. Monster Squad aired Saturday mornings on NBC from September 11, 1976 to September 3rd, 1977. Monster Squad featured a sort of comedic superhero team of monsters that do good deeds and fight bad guys in order to make up for the misdeeds of their past. The monster heroes included Dracula, Wolfman, and the Frankenstein's monster. According to the show, Walt, a criminology student who was also a night watchman at a wax museum, built a crime computer that somehow brought to life wax statues of the legendary monsters. In the show, the monsters all seem to have the memories of the real monsters, which leads you to believe that somehow they are the real deal that's been brought back to life. Now, the wolfman called the werewolf in the intro. That also, I have a gun. That won't stop me. With silver bullets. That will stop me. <laughs> Went by the name of Bruce W. Wolf. He was played by Buck Cartalian. Most likely due to copyright reasons, they may have not realized at the beginning of production, the Wolfman's name on his plaque changed several times. It went from Wolfman as one word to Wolfman as two words. And also as just Werewolf. The really strange thing is, though, is how that within the same introduction scene, the titles of the monsters change from being painted onto their pedestals to being posted signs. Come on, you guys. Work time. Oh, and also likely due to copyright reasons, Frankenstein's bolts were on top of his head instead of in his neck. In his own twisted and distorted lexicon, he calls it faith, strength, truth. But in just a moment, Peter Vollmer will apply his... You are about to enter another dimension. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. In the episode, Where Is Everybody? Earl Holloman from the series Police Woman and the movie The Sons of Katie Elder plays Mike Ferris, a man who is lost in a small town where he appears to be the last man in the whole world. Or is he? Even though Ferris is completely alone in the small town, in the phone booth you can actually see a reflection of someone right next to Ferris. In one scene there's a lit cigar in a local jail, but no one is around to claim it. Could this be the man? And why can't Ferris see him? There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. Anybody here? He may not want to know the answer to that. Hey! Hey! If you look closely at the glass, you can see ghostly figures hovering back and forth. Figures that Ferris cannot see, apparently. Are these mannequins moving positions between shots? Or is this some sort of optical illusion? Now you think about that now, because this is the Twilight Zone. Time enough at last. Time enough at last, of course, has stood out as one of the best TV episodes of all time. 
Burgess Meredith stars in this one as a man who just wants to be left alone to read, and he gets his wish and an atomic bomb makes him the last man on Earth. As Henry Bemis walks through the rubble, he stubs his toe against a large concrete boulder, which moves easily, despite the fact it should be heavy and unmoving, apart from the use of heavy equipment. Could this be foreshadowing of another Twilight Zone episode, Mr. Dingle the Strong, where Meredith is granted super strength by aliens? Or could Henry Bemis be on his way to becoming a superhero in this reality, due to the uh, radiation from the bomb, instead of, of course, dying as one might think? You unlock this door with the key of imagination. In the episode, What You Need, time flows backward just for a second, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with the episode's story. Notice as the cigarette smoke is flowing backwards into the man's cigarette, instead of outward. The journey into the shadows that we're about to watch could be our journey. The next two goofs come from the episode, The Hitchhiker, her name is Nan Adams. She's 27 years old. Take a good look at Nan's car. It appears to be a Mercury model. Now, after being hounded for several miles by the mysterious hitchhiker, Nan tries to run him down with her car. But the really bizarre thing is that the car has not only changed models, it's also changed colors into a dark black. And then it's back to the same Mercury. Here's the really weird thing. She sees a sign that says gas up ahead. She turns around and goes the opposite direction and still manages to run into the gas station. Now this happened earlier in the episode. When Claude Aikens tries to start his car, Jack Weston is at the end of the car. A young girl walks up to the car, looks in the passenger window, and all of a sudden when the camera angle changes, instantly Jack uh, is there and replacing the girl. In the episode, A Thing About Machines, an old man hates machines, and the machines come alive and hate him right back, so much they try to kill him. His own car tries to run him down without a driver. Or is there more here than what we were led to believe? Careful observation indicates that there was someone in the car, hiding below the dashboard. Perhaps if they could not kill Mr. Finchley, they hoped to drive him insane. Adjusting the color, it's easy to see the shadow of a driver who was no doubt responsible for all the machines going crazy in Mr. Finchley's home. And now we know, despite what we were led to believe, it is apparent that Mr. Finchley's car did not come alive and try to kill him by itself. It had a driver. Examining the shots, lightened up of course, of the doctor from Eye of the Beholder, reveals that the doctor and the nurses may have been shapeshifters, or were wearing masks to try to drive Ellie Mae Clampett insane. But why? Why must we feel that way, nurse? I think it could have been a scam to get all of her money. Why shouldn't people be allowed to be different? Why? Or it could be that they were prejudiced against her because she was from the country and they were city slickers. Just a guess. Now you think about that now, because this is the Twilight Zone. In the episode Mr. Dingle the Strong, Burgess Meredith picks up Don Rickles over his head, and well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I got nothing. Clearly this was not Burgess Meredith or Don Rickles doing this stunt. Yeah, despite the fact that Burgess Meredith did train Rocky Balboa, I don't think that's him. In the episode, The Rip Van Winkle Caper, four fully dressed gold robbers are gassed and fall asleep when in glass cases for a hundred years. However, a hundred years later, when one of them is discovered dead by the others, his body is a skeleton, but his clothing has completely vanished. They use some sort of gas, of course, to keep themselves alive and preserved for a hundred years, but I wonder what they use to keep the gas, oil, battery, and tires from going bad on their truck. And whatever they did was wasted because this jerk decides to run over his buddy with the truck and off a cliff for some reason. The episode The Grave is a very cool western episode with a small goof that still manages to still look okay. If you look closely you can see a vertical line in the sky where the backdrop art was folded. But just look at this still of Lee Marvin. I mean, is this not cool looking? I mean, this would be 
an amazing comic book cover or any other kind of art. I mean, it just anything with Lee Marvin in it anyway is a, is a great episode. Did you ever wonder why the giant aliens in the episode To Serve Man, played by Richard Kill, had to dunk to go through doors in their own spaceship? In the episode Night Call, an elderly lady is being harassed from a phone call that seems to be originating from the cemetery. Hello? Hello? When she is sitting in her car at the cemetery, there's a person's reflection visible in the car window. Now that's spooky. Sometimes goofs just make a show even better. Or maybe Rod Serling meant for us to see that years later. In the episode The Changing of the Guard, after Professor Fowler has a friendly ghost encounter with former students that have passed away, and he goes to a window to hear carolers, his glasses appear and disappear and reappear again. Here's a good from the episode A Kind of a Stopwatch. McNulty activates a watch that can stop time itself. At one point in the episode, we see a shot of what looks like an older film from the 1920s or 1930s but it's supposed to be 1960s present day. In the episode number 12 looks just like you. A young woman's arm is cut off on the side by the split screen process used to enable Susie Parker to appear on screen as two different characters. On the episode Stopover in a Quiet Town, a couple is completely alone in a town with no memory of how they got there. It's a very spooky episode and even spookier when you notice that in this scene, way over to the left, Someone is moving. It's really hard to see, but there is definitely somebody there. In that same episode, crew members are visible for just a split second as they pan from the characters to Rod Serling's narrative. Men's either dead or ghosts. Good thing I don't believe in ghosts. Well, neither do I, but let's, uh, let's get out of here anyway. Oh, um, I failed. Watch out. <laughs> Take back. I was out here. Yeah, about that. Uh, Igor, would you give me a hand with these bags? Certainly. You take the blonde and I'll take the one in the turban. Uh. <laughs> oh, stop that! <laughs> Basta. May I go in? Hey, check out my TV Crazy Man YouTube main page for all kinds of interesting classic TV stuff. Please subscribe, hit the bell for future no notifications, like, let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks and have a great day. Also, if you get a chance, check out my latest video on my cartoon channel, the Frady Cat Cartoons channel. I just finished my third Three Stooges cartoon mix.